Welcome to Oak Hills Community Church. I'm glad y'all are here with us this, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning. Now, if my voice starts doing that, <clears throat> you guys are going to have to sing louder. Yep. Uh, that's not a bad idea anyhow, especially if you can sing on key. If you can't sing on key, I'll take lip syncing. Just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm really just kidding. My name's Gary, and I get the privilege of leading us in worship this morning. Would you all stand with us as we open in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought each and every one of us here today. We thank you, Father, that you're even uh, leading people to watch us online. Father, I pray that uh, you would help us all to focus on who you are and what you've done, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to start singing a song called Blessed Be Your Name. Say 
turn to one another and greet one another and then have a seat. We're going to have a video here in just a second. All right, y'all go ahead and have a seat. We got a video from VBS to watch, so if you'll sit down and we'll play it. Welcome everybody to Oak Hills Community Church. We've got quite a few announcements today. Uh, let's see. First up, we have a Lego night this week, July 3rd, 6, 3, 6 o'clock to 8 p.m. Uh, ages K 
kindergarten to sixth grade. And where our next youth group night is July 10th. Uh, it's a Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. And I just wanted to, I should have started this off as a welcome. You'll have to forgive me. I'm a little discombobulated. I'm not used to having so much literature to do an announcement. So I'm a little thrown off my game. Welcome. If whether you're a longtime member, you're a first time attendee, you're a guest, visitor, it is such a blessing to worship the Lord with you today. So thank you for being here. Uh, let's see. Yes, we have on July 4th, Michelle and I are having a 4th of July, what we call a Freedom Fest, which is really just uh, a fancy way of saying barbecue, uh, and, and we're going to have ribs and hamburgers and hot dogs, you know, all American food on July 4th. So you come over to our house, we've got a pool. Michelle just got uh, a, a, a pool uh, volleyball net so you can have we'll play pool volleyball, bring the kids, grandkids, whatever, um, and everybody's welcome. Uh, we just believe in fellowship, that God has gifted us uh, with a small skill and ability to smoke meat, and we want to share that with people. So if you have nothing else to do, please come over to our house. The address is in your uh, brochure, your program, come over to our house between one and five. So it's going to end in plenty of time for you to go see fireworks somewhere. Uh, and it is in the heat of the day. So if you don't want to get in the outside in the pool, just come inside in the air conditioning and there'll be games, board games, and, or just good old fashioned chin wagon, as we say, people visiting. Uh, hopefully you can, you can come to that. We have next Sunday is a mission meal. If you don't come on July 4th, but you're still hungry for some Holy Smoker barbecue, come back on Sunday. I've been commissioned uh, to, to smoke some meat. And so we got, we went shopping yesterday, Michelle and I did, and we've got, we're going to have brisket. We're going to have chicken, which will have, some will be the seasoned chicken and some will be the not so seasoned chicken and sausage. Uh, plus whatever else uh, is, is going to be planned in the sides and stuff. Let's see. Potato salad, baked beans, and apple cobbler. <whistles> Good stuff. So please come and uh, after, it'll be right after worship service. We'll have a mission meal, just a meal. You don't have to pay anything. It's, it's free. The church provides all the food. We do ask that if you were going to go out to eat after service and you were going to buy a lunch, that you might consider donating that amount of money towards supporting our missionaries. And the missionaries we're supporting are the ones in Moldova, which is uh, right next door to Ukraine. It's a very interesting place, and they have lots of neat stories. But they'll be coming and sharing their story with us next Sunday. Let's see, what else? Freedom, oh, congregational prayer time. Sweet House of Prayer is this Saturday uh, coming up. At 10, from 10 to 11, we have coffee, we get together in little small huddle groups, and we pray for each other. We pray for our church, we pray for our communities, for our schools, and for our nation, whatever is on your heart. And it's a sweet time to come and pray together, which is really a good thing, a good thing. God has commanded us to do that, and I really do believe he blesses it. The church that prays together stays together. Okay. Now to the literature. Stuart is to read. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's the quiet part. Okay. An all day planning for the future workshop will be held here at the church on Saturday, October 12th. So we're going to announce this uh, several times in the future. Legal and financial professionals will provide information on the issues and documents we all face in the event of incapacitation or death of a loved one, particularly a spouse. The focus will be what can or should be done now in preparation, as well as what to expect later. To gauge the amount of interest, there is a three-question survey on the table in the auditorium hallway. So in between these two double doors here, I guess. Uh, please take a moment to fill it out and leave it in the basket on the table. Signing your name on the bottom does not commit you to anything. It just helps the planters to have a more accurate head count. That's pretty important. You know, you never want to 
you know, Lord forbid, just be surprised one day and your world has just turned upside down and you don't have any plans at all. You don't know where the, what the account numbers are. You don't know where the will is or even if there is a will and how you go about all that stuff. Those are the questions that this seminar is going to be addressing. Really important stuff. Okay, last comes from the nest. They are putting together Bibles for their class, uh, classrooms for the kiddos. And, he, and Suzanne says, if you would like to be a part of placing a Bible in every classroom for all 100 Nest students, please stop by the desk in the lobby over there. Uh, Bibles have been chosen for different age groups, and your contribution of only $15 will give each child a brand new Bible to use throughout the 2024-2025 school year. This is a new program they're doing, giving the kids a Bible right at the beginning of the school year, and you know they're going to use it all year long. So I think that's great. Um, but if you can't afford the $15, that's okay. She says it's more important to pray this Bible in the hands of children, that it will be the beginning of our children's spiritually strong journey through life following Jesus. Praise God for that. And she said, handwritten here, Stuart, don't forget to welcome Nest families. If you have a child that goes to the Nest and you are in attendance today, thank you for coming. It is such a blessing. Praise God. Praise God. We are blessed by your presence. We're blessed to kind of co-minister with the nest over there. Uh, and it's just fun to come to church pretty much any day of the week. And there's somebody up here doing something for the Lord. And that's very reassuring. That's it. Thank you, Stuart. <clears throat> We're going to continue singing now. We're going to start with one called, <clears throat> Oh, How I Need You. Um, now, the first part, we're going to do a cappella. You don't have to sing along with that part. The second part is 6-8 time. Please sing along in that part. The last, most of the song is a toe tapper. Feel free to toe tap, hand slap, just not each other. Okay? Worship the Lord with us. <clears throat> stand, stand with us. <clears throat> Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else I need you.
Father, indeed, we give you thanks. You've provided all we need for life and godliness, and we are grateful for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all can have a seat. Savannah's going to come and lead us in our prayer time, and then Stuart's going to be bringing our message this morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see so many people just worshiping our Heavenly Father. And whenever um, we were singing in Christ alone, one of the lyrics just really hit me and brought me so much peace. So while we pray, let's think of this lyric. Um, he... We are his and he is mine. And that is just the pr most precious thing <laughs> that is so sweet. So let's bow our heads and think of that sentiment while we talk to him. Father God, we thank you for another beautiful week. Thank you for all your provision and grace. Lord, we thank you for a godly environment to raise children in. And we pray that your truth would reside in them forever. You are truly a good father, and we pray that we would be equipped for the next week to do whatever honors and glorifies you. We pray for our friends going through the trial of cancer. We lift up Jim, Janet, Lynette, and Christy. For each of these families, we just pray that you would be with them, comfort them, and provide them abundant peace. Take care of their finances and all needs. Please, Lord. We are exceptionally saddened by the passing of Mary, who battled, who battled colon cancer until the end of her life. Father, we just are so grateful, though, that you triumph over death and that the separation from her is only temporary. We lift up our friends facing various trials. For Cindy, we pray that you, um, your favor would shine on her and that that favor would encourage the insurance and construction companies to do the right thing by her. God, we pray that you would alleviate all anxiety she may be feeling during this circumstance. And we pray for Susie as she takes care of Jim. God, please continue to encourage her. We lift up Todd, a coworker of Gary's. Lord, Though he has contracted something and it might affect his heart and lungs, Lord, we just pray that you would prevail over it, providing him swift healing and that his heart and lungs would not be compromised. Father, we pray for Marie's Casita and Motorhome. We just pray that it would sell swiftly and fairly and that you would encourage a buyer to come by and see just how beautiful her property is. We pray that every need in the meantime would be provided for. For Linda A., we pray that you would keep her in good spirits as she faces complications after her surgery. We pray that you would guide our dear friend Kelly with the right attitude and heart to face each task you lay before her. We pray for Cindy, Kelly's cousin. We pray that you would restore her breathing and heal her sinuses completely. We continue to lift up Jim, whose lung transplants may be rejecting. Lord God, we just... Pray that his medical team um, would make the best decisions for him. And we, we pray that you would guide him and Nyla to see your mercies each day. We pray for Linda C.'s doctor's appointment tomorrow. We pray that her sugar levels would not swing so much. Please guide her medical team to come up with a sustainable plan for her. We, pray, we also pray for Stephen, Emma's son. We pray that his healing would be complete without any complications, and we thank you for all that you've done so far in his treatment and healing. We continue to lift up the Lees as they plan to go to Belize for their medical mission trip. We pray that this mission trip would be a blessing to every person, worker, and patient. Lord, may many, many people come to believe in Christ through this trip, and may you just bless the hands of the workers as they tend to each need. Father, we pray that your will would be done in each of these circumstances. Help us to see your sovereignty in all outcomes. We pray that the teaching would be edifying to us that we're about to receive. And God, just help us to be the salt and light for your kingdom. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. If you've, this sermon has been in, in the works for a while. Um, been really distressed about what I've seen on the news, particularly amongst young people on college campuses and things. And so, uh, here we go. I've seen things in the news over the last few months that make me wonder what in the world is going on. It looks like civilization is decaying in front of our eyes, and it's our young people who are leading the way over the cliff into chaos. I got to the point where I'm thinking, where are they learning this? Where is all of this coming from? Particularly the really concerning part of anti-Semitism. I wanted to know if they'd ever seen videos of the Holocaust or what the young Hitler youth were doing to Jewish folks in the streets of Germany. Unfortunately, they're being taught it. The news often gets me to thinking of a roller coaster charging into perdition. So I've been thinking a lot about our nation, our culture, and our past. These are some of my reflections. We recently remembered the 80th anniversary of D-Day, and I wondered what the greatest generation would think about what's going on today in America. I wonder if the founding fathers had our current state in mind when they forged the greatest civil documents ever written, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution for a free representative country. It seems like this nation is tearing itself apart, pursuing individual diversity without any unifying principle that brings us together as if we no longer have the common cause of safeguarding liberty and promoting freedom. Laws are trivialized and ignored by people in authority responsible for maintaining them. Or authority seems to attack citizens in a tyrannical con contempt of the individual's constitutional rights of speech, assembly, and faith. I think the problems we see are the results of a nation turning its back on God. But there is a solution to this decay. Part of it is found in our very own building. Our children's ministry does an excellent job of teaching the faith to the kids here on Sunday. And we all should encourage and support the children's and children and workers in this critical form of worship any way we can. Volunteer to help out on Sunday mornings just once a month or every couple of months. Help in the events during the week like Lego night and youth night. But most of all, pray for our kids and their teachers. Another part of the solution is the Nest Preschool here that teaches young children the core principles of both education and Christianity during the week. Brothers and sisters, I think the hope for the world is to raise children with a foundation of truth knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, it is vital to preserve civilization that we teach children the Bible. It is our mission as parents and teachers and Christians. Thankfully, the nest shows us how a Christian school can pursue this lofty goal and provide a top-notch education. Nest graduates are going into first grade already knowing so much more than the other children that enter first grade. They know phonics, the rudiments of math, dare I say. <laughs> 
they're well-adjusted children. They can get along with other children. I've borrowed some verses the nest uses to teach its kids and that we can all take to heart and pass on to our own children, both children of the flesh, meaning our family, and children of the spirit. These are people that we witness to or work with or we just happen to meet at the store. As Christians, we can find these spiritual children anywhere and people that we can teach the gospel truth. It is a duty and a privilege to live our faith, share our faith, and teach our faith, particularly to children in terms that they can understand. As I go through these verses, think about not just how you can communicate them to others, but they, how they can apply to your own grown-up life. If we are to witness to the world, we need to know the basics, the ABCs of truth. So let's begin trusting God just like little children. All teaching of every subject must have a starting point, and that includes Christianity. What better place to start than at the beginning of everything? The first verse the nest teaches is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This verse answers the age-old questions of origin and purpose. Everything was created by God, who has always existed without beginning and without end. And he created out of love and for a reason. Knowing that mankind is not the ultimate being in the universe makes us accountable. It should make us humble. But it tells us there is a higher power and authority than anything on earth and one we will all answer to at some point. Our founding fathers recognized this as the Declaration of Independence clearly shows. And it opens with these great words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it closes with words just as powerful. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, that's God, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. In short, our founding fathers were willing to commit everything they had and everything they were to founding our homeland. God is real. He is eternal all-powerful, and all-knowing. Everything that exists or has ever existed or will ever exist is subject to him. We answer to the one true living God, both as individuals and as a nation. And this leads us to the next truth through a question. If God is all-powerful and all-knowing, why is the world such a mess? <laughs> Sin. Sin is when humans choose to do things God doesn't like. The second verse central to the nest is Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We humans are inherently sinful, thinking, speaking, and acting in very bad ways. Even the very best of us cannot behave properly 100% of the time. We are selfish, often seeing other people as obstructions to getting what we want. If you don't believe me, just ask a parent who refuses to let their child have ice cream before they eat their dinner. You'll see how sinful the little rascals can be. <laughs> Worse still, 
there's not anything we can do to save ourselves from such a wretched condition and please our creator. Left to ourselves alone, we are all lost, descending into the very depths of depravity. This happened once before, and it's recorded in the Bible. Now, these verses that I'm about to read are not part of the nest verses. That would just scare the kids, and they would leave and would never come back. But they do clearly illustrate the reason God caused the flood in Genesis 6, 5, and 7. The, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. So the Lord was sorry that he had made mankind on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. Then the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the land. Mankind and animals as well, and crawling things and the birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. I know my mother is asking, why did God kill the animals? Well, the answer is uh, these are land animals. Man was created to be sovereign over them. And when the leader becomes polluted by evil, it infects everything he or she leads. Another good question is why does God allow sin to be in his creation? The answer is love. Love must be a freely made choice. It cannot be coerced or commanded or constructed because if it is any of those things, then it's not really love. That means that humanity had to be given the choice to love God or not. And the not part is sin, always. Anything we love more than God, including ourselves, leads us to do something bad eventually, something that the holy God detests and will not allow in his presence. When we sin, as Christians, we fall out of fellowship with God until we apologize and repent. And to repent means to change, to go from a direction towards sin to a direction towards God. We have to try not to sin again. We'll fail every day. But if we don't try, that's when we get in deep, deep yogurt. Very bad trouble. But there is hope. Just as God provided Noah and his family with an ark and two of every animal as a do-over for creation, he provides the ultimate solution to our heart problem, our struggle with sin. Jesus Christ. The solution to our sinful state is Jesus, who loves us so much, he took upon himself the punishment for our sins to satisfy God's holy justice so we could be forgiven by our faith in him and made righteous like him and come before God with new hearts to spend eternity with the Lord in peace. The third verse the nest teaches is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God is grieved by our sinful state, but he loves us too much to leave us in sin without hope for being made right with him. His son, Jesus Christ, fully human and fully God, came to earth 2,000 plus years ago to teach, heal, and save us by bearing the justice of God for our sins so we could be forgiven by God's grace 
through faith in him. Look at this verse carefully. You'll note a few things. First, God gave. God was not compelled to provide salvation to mankind. He wanted to save man. He wanted to present it as a gift, not as anything we had to earn. All we have to do is truly accept his salvation through Jesus Christ and give ourselves to him completely. And don't worry that you're not good enough for Jesus because no one is. He will clean up the mess we've made of our lives. Yeah, I like that. There's a couple of amens over here. Praise God. Secondly, we see that God gave of himself. The Son of God, Jesus, gave humanity a solid pathway to redemption. Faith, belief, absolute trust in him, recognizing that we need a Savior because we cannot save ourselves. We trust Jesus to right our wrongs. The third thing we see, God's motivation was and is love, and it always has been. It's a love we cannot fully comprehend because he gave not only himself, but his son. He gave his son for us when we were still his enemy. We were not God's friends. And if you think about it, every person is saved while he or she is an active enemy of God. Our creator loves us with a love without limits. And that's why he continues to forgive us when we continue to mess up. Usually happens in the church parking lot right after dismissal. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jesus explains how the Lord's salvation works, why his work is so important. And again, the key is love. The fourth verse the nest teaches is John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way for humans to be reconciled with the creator. There is no other option. He is not a way. He is the way. Yes. His word, the Bible, is truth. The only truth that matters now and into eternity after we die. He is life, a life of purpose and fulfillment, joy, community, and thanksgiving now and forever, even after we part from the earth. Jesus promises to give us this wonderful life for all time, peace and joy with God. We follow his way by living according to his standards. We know what to do and what to avoid when we accept the truth. And we commit our lives to a wonderful purpose in his love, sharing his love with other people. Without Jesus, there is no way to be reconciled with the creator, to have our sins blotted out forever and to come home to our eternal Father. And one of the ways we follow Jesus on his way to obey his commands, and one of the big ones, is to share the truth and God's love with other people. And this leads us to the fifth verse that the nest teaches, Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. We are to teach his message to people we meet in any way we can. Sometimes 
we use words to explain that we are all sinners, we are separated from God, and we desperately need a Savior. Sometimes we act out the gospel by forgiving others who don't deserve it or even ask for it. Sometimes we show God's love through acting kindly and compassionately and generously. Sometimes we pray for and with people. Sometimes we just walk through life with people for a while until they ask, why are you so happy? Even in tough times, you're happy. Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you about somebody. See, all of this is sharing the gospel. And we can all do something like this to invite people to church with us or come to a small group Bible study or heck, just go shopping. All of these things honor God and invite others to come to him when he is the focus of everything we do. Evangelism shopping. Try it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Michelle takes folks out to the, they go on road trips and they go to uh, antique stores. And they descend on them like a herd of, I don't even know what. <laughs> and they have the best time. And it's fellowship. It's discipleship. Christians, being with Christians, having fun. We have been given as Christians the greatest gift there is, and we should be willing and eager to share it with others. Next, we follow Jesus in his truth by our conduct, how we live our lives with love as our motivation in all things, just like Jesus did. The sixth verse the nest teaches reminds us of living ethical and morally upright lives. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 reads, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought for a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. See, as God created the universe, he also created moral and ethical conduct. The Bible teaches us right and wrong behaviors, just a few of which are honor God, tell the truth, don't steal, cheat, or defraud, be faithful to your spouse. Don't hurt other people in any way. Don't be greedy or envious. But be kind and gentle with people. Be generous to those less fortunate than you. Pursue justice. Be brave in the face of adversity. Love without limits. When we do these things, we honor praise and show gratitude to God. And it goes a long way towards sharing the gospel and discipling others. But life is tough if you haven't noticed. And there are evil people and evil forces out there opposed to God and his children of faith. It's easy to be fearful, but God is our champion and he commands us to have courage the nest's seventh verse encourages us to be strong no matter what happens. Isaiah 41.10 reads, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will also help you. I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. The world can be a very scary place when it goes insane and evil runs rampant. There's two examples from history I'll just mention. The French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. 
both started with very high but very human ideals that were supposed to better society. Liberating man from oppression, economic oppression, political oppression. But both movements descended very quickly, almost overnight, into injustice, chaos, and widespread violence, ending in two of the most tyrannical regimes in human history. A similarity of these revolutions is that they both rejected God as a core tenant of their ideology. God knows this sinful, evil state of the world, and he does not abandon those who trust in him. Isaiah's prophecies were concerning the approaching downfall of Israel because the Israelites had rejected God out of both their public and private lives. God was going to bring a calamity upon them. God's message through Isaiah was that the people should repent and come back to him, forget about worshiping false gods. People worship false gods, idols, or ideologies because those things are under human control. In other words, some people like to create God in their own image. But there is only one God. And ignoring that fact is a diversion from reality. That's something we used to call insanity. So, when things look darkest, when you are tempted to sin, when you are afflicted beyond your ability to endure, when you suffer, reach out to the Lord. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. This is the life Jesus promised, a life of internal connection to God, not a life without pain. That's never been promised. But it's a life of never being abandoned. One of my personal favorite verses, not the nest, it doesn't have anything to do with the nest. It's my verse that I like. It's 1 Chronicles 28, 20. Aging King David is dying, and he's going to leave the kingdom to his son Solomon, and he gives him these wonderful words. David said to his son Solomon, be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. When is the work of the house of the Lord finished? Never. Right. Be strong by trusting in God, seeking his will in prayer, and through studying his word. Then act Stand up for what is right. Oppose what is wrong. Protect those who cannot defend themselves. Be kind and forgiving. In other words, act like Jesus. Isaiah and most of the prophets promised that God would preserve a faithful remnant to future blessing. Brothers and sisters, don't be afraid, but have courage. Fear can swamp our reason and lead us right into sin. Peter denied Jesus three times because he was scared, but God forgave him. God strengthened him, and he became a leader of the earliest Christian church. Suffering is part of life, and if we suffer, because someone with power over us hates God and takes their hatred out on us, we're in good company. 
We join the countless martyrs, apostles, and even Jesus himself in suffering for what is true and good. And God will give you the courage to endure. Always remember that you are in his righteous hands. Because God is completely good, his love for us never ends and his mercies never cease, we should always praise and worship him, spreading the good news. The last verse from the nest encourages us to love and praise the Lord. Psalm 9 verse 1, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. We are to humbly thank the Lord for, well, everything. For his salvation, his creation, and his love. For the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the homes in which we live. For our Christian family, for our blood family, for our friends. For our vocations, for his provision, for his help in getting us out of trouble. <laughs> Everything the Lord does is a wonder. Rain, dawns, sunsets, dogs, cats, and other pets that brighten up our lives. The love of that perfect person he picked out just for you forever. For the children we have. For forgiving us every day when we fall short. For loving us as broken and flawed as we are. Yes, we are just human, living in a broken world, but God is greater than everything in the world. He loves us, saves us, forgives us, and will never, ever leave us. The verses that the nest uses provide a good introduction to the Christian faith. They teach principles vital to leading the productive life of a good citizen. And they give the reasons for such a wholesome life. Brothers and sisters, these eight verses don't teach everything we need to live the Christian faith, but they are a great start. Let's recap the eight truths we learned through them. Everything starts and ends with God who is eternal, just, and loving. Humanity is twisted by sin and cannot correct this state without a savior. And because God loves us, he provides the saving solution in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus is the only way to peace, salvation, and eternal life. He wants us to share the truth and his love with others. We should conduct ourselves according to his standard of ethics and morality. We are to be brave in a dark world because God is always with us. And for the good changes God makes in us, we are to praise him all our days. Sadly, public schools have not taught divine truth for a long time. In some schools, I imagine that being a Christian teacher would be very, very difficult. But the nest shows how to teach the basics to very small children. We only have to look at our world to see why Christian education is so important. Amen? Support Christian teachers wherever you find them. Give them a hug and encouragement Invite them to your church if they don't attend one. And attend their church with them once in a while if they do. But most importantly, pray for them. Pray for all the schools your children attend. That God would work there to move hearts and minds toward him. Work to make Jesus Christ the center point of education, however you can. Even if it's only voting in local elections for Christians to be on school boards or run for office yourself. Just remember, 
Your child's education is your responsibility, not the state's. Do your best for your children always. They depend on you, and they will follow the example you set. There are three lessons I'd like for you to take away. First, teach the Bible. The truths it contains are the basis for a productive life now and an eternal life of peace. The more we can teach these truths to children, the greater chance they will take root and blossom into gardens of Christians who will lead their generation out of the mess we are in. Maybe they will avoid our mistakes. Second lesson, be an example of faith. Faith to your children primarily and to other people in general. Let others see you praying, studying your Bible, and inviting people to church. Your kids want to be like you. Other people will be interested in the love and joy God shines through you. We are all commissioned to spread the gospel, and it starts with our families. Third lesson, true joy comes from true love. If we want our children to be happy, then we must teach them that God is real, he loves them, and he has a purpose for them. There is no greater love than the love which God pours out on us. Jesus himself bore the Father's justice for our sins so we could be joined with him in eternal joy and love. That's love we cannot imagine, but it's real. His love is the source of our joy through the darkest of days, and it will be for our children too. Yes, we are a free country, but freedom without a basis in truth and without accountability to laws and morals is chaos. Noah's generation had total freedom, and it didn't end well for them, did it? Teach and live the truth of God and humanity. It is our best hope for a better world for our children. This is what it means in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And note how important the word teaching is. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our first disciples are those closest to us, within our family, our children. We are all commissioned by Jesus to make disciples. So teach, be an example, and love just like Jesus did. Raise your kids and everyone else you know with a knowledge of Jesus and his word and at the very least, they will always have a lifeline to fall back on when life gets rough. At best, God opens their hearts to him completely, and they lead the very best kind of life, a life devoted to divine purposes. In conclusion, I'll just say this. Be encouraged. We are in the hands of the Almighty God. Our job is to point out the way to him to our children and other people. My best friend sent this last bit to me after I officiated his wedding recently. I found it incredibly encouraging. I hope you will too. It's written by a guy named Alex Craven. He's a, as far as I know, the only thing I could find about this guy is that he's a dad and a youth pastor in Russellville, Arkansas. That's it. I don't know any other credential, but it's good stuff. God knew and God knows. Don't feel sorry 
for or fear for your kids or grandkids because the world they are going to grow up in is not what it used to be. God created them and called them for this exact moment in time. Their life wasn't a coincidence or an accident. Raise them up to know the power they walk in as children of God. Train them up in the authority of his word. Teach them to walk in faith knowing that God is in control. Empower them to know they can change the world. Don't teach them to be fearful and disheartened by the state of the world, but hopeful that they can do something about it. Every person in all of history has been placed in that particular time because they were in God's sovereign plan. He knew Daniel could handle the lion's den. He knew David could handle Goliath. He knew Esther could handle Haman. He knew Peter and Paul could handle persecution. He knows that your child can handle whatever challenge they face in their life. He created them specifically for it. Don't be scared for your kids. Be honored that God chose you to parent the generation that is facing the biggest challenge of our lifetimes. Rise up to the challenge. Raise Daniels, Davids, Esthers, Peters, and Pauls. God isn't scratching his head wondering what he's going to do with this mess of a world. He has an army he's raising up to drive back the darkness and make him known all over the earth. Don't let your fear steal the greatness God placed in them. I know it's hard to imagine them as anything besides our sweet little babies, and we just want to protect them from anything that could ever be hard on them, but they were born for such a time as this. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for our children and the privilege and responsibility to teach them. Give us the courage, the strength, wisdom, and love to teach the truth, to be brave, joyful, joyful, and hopeful in their lives. May we all be strong and courageous to stand with you no matter what. What a joy it is to be with you. Please save our children. Give them a holy purpose to build a better world. We love you. And we trust you in all things. Amen. Thank you, Stuart. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing our last song. It's called Our Great God.
service please yes benediction today is from second timothy chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 i charge you in the presence of god and of christ jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom preach the word be ready in season and out of season reprove rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. <laughs> Go hug a teacher, y'all. <laughs> Love you. You're dismissed.